Foraging is searching for and eating food. For animals, foraging is how animals fuel their survival and reproduction, so it's pretty essential to fitness. Lots of animal behavior centers around trying to forage really well, so how does an animal forage well? In theory, animals can maximize their fitness by gaining as much energy as possible from the food that they eat. That principle is captured by optimal foraging theory. The theory proposes that animals should make foraging decisions by minimizing their energy spent on things like traveling to find food or struggling with the animal or other living thing they're trying to eat. Meanwhile, animals should maximize the energy gained from their food and maybe try to get in some essential nutrients as well. So when this plays out in theoretical real life, an animal like the big blue fish here might not gain very much by eating those little tiny yellow fish right close by, even though they're easy to get to. And the big blue fish might ignore that green eel looking thing because again, even though it's close by, it's probably pretty hard to catch. It looks like it could put up a fight. There's too much energy spent in getting to it. But the medium pink sized fish seems ideal. It's a little further out, but it looks like it'll provide a good meal for the big blue. Under optimal foraging theory, the blue fish should go for this pink fish. Of course, animals in nature don't always make optimal foraging choices. So optimal foraging theory is a null model. If an animal is foraging optimally, then they're probably trying to maximize their energy gains. But if an animal isn't foraging optimally, then there's something more complicated that might be at play. What could that be? The two biggest problems that get in the way of optimal foraging are competitors and predators. Competitors will try to prevent an animal from getting to its food, while predators pose an even bigger threat of trying to kill the animal. So how can an animal get around these problems? Animals avoid competition by staying in the niche that their species occupies. A niche is the time, space, and even set of activities that the species lives in. So that encompasses the physical location where it sleeps and reproduces and rears young, as well as the time of year that it's in that location. The niche also includes that species' diet, the times at which they forage or hunt for food, and how they access that food. You can think of a niche as an imperfect puzzle piece that the species is on, fitting into its broader community. The birds pictured here live on the same tree, but have separate niches determined by the height of the tree at which they find food. They avoid each other, and so they don't compete. Ideally. But how do they avoid each other so well? After all, it's possible that the Cape May warbler up top could actually eat things on all parts of the tree, but maybe it's limited by the presence of the other birds. That limitation is the difference between a fundamental niche and a realized niche. A fundamental niche is the whole extent of the time and space in which a species could survive. A realized niche is where that species actually ends up due to competition. The classic experiment illustrating this concept was done with barnacles. The fundamental niche of the small brown barnacles is the whole zone between high tide and low tide. But the big blue barnacles' fundamental niche is smaller since they need to be covered in water more often to survive. And it so happens that the big blue barnacles are capable of growing in a way that peels off any little brown barnacles. So the little brown barnacles get kicked off of the lower portion of the rock and their realized niche is only the upper portion. Separately, a forager also needs to be sure to avoid predators. There are three main strategies for avoiding predators. Blending in so the predators don't see you, standing out so that predators know to avoid you, and making the most of a social group to keep predators away. Blending in works when an animal manages to match its background, like this barely visible little animal. This type of camouflage is called crypsis. The downside is that cryptic animals need to find the surface that looks like them and very likely be still often enough to remain barely visible. Standing out is a good option for animals that are poisonous or have some other kind of weapon. It's an honest signal to potential predators. In a world where most spe prey species hide, if something is this easy to find, there's probably a good reason to not eat it. That's called aposematic coloration, and it comes in a bunch of different patterns like on this frog and on this wasp. Finally, social animals can work together to decrease the probabil probability of predation. Some bird species engage in a behavior called mobbing, where they give loud alarm cries and may even try to attack a predator to get it to go away. Another benefit of being in a large group is that it decreases the probability that a predator will eat you specifically. 
If a predator can only eat one antelope at a time, and you, as an antelope, are in a group with two other antelopes, then you have a one in three chance of being eaten. But if you're in a group with a hundred other antelopes, your odds just improve to one in 100. This benefit of being in a large group is called the dilution effect. Finally, social groups may look out for one another by taking breaks from feeding to scan the area, looking for threats. Scanning behavior, as shown by these meerkats, is often accompanied by warning calls when a predator appears. This behavior is particularly common in closely related social groups. So if an animal manages to avoid predators and also avoid competitors, then it can get back to eating the things that it actually wants to eat.